Well, here I am. No one would introduce me. After yesterday, <laughs> they said, you're just on your own. And uh, they don't want to admit they know me. And, uh, but uh, again, I'm so thankful you're here. And uh, I think we've had a great conference together. <laughs> and I... Uh, I think of uh, RC and Vesta and what they started 50 years ago and how with the blessing of the Lord and the dedicated faithfulness of, of the Sprouls and of the uh, staff that supported them and of, of Chris Larson, who uh, even though he wouldn't introduce me and <laughs> did you notice that he said definitively I was not the hottest teaching fellow? He might have said it was debatable, you know, uh, that, would, that would have been all right, uh, but well, anyway, um, I have ways of getting even. Um, <laughs> but it's been a wonderful time of blessing, uh, I think, for all of us, a wonderful time of inspiration and instruction. Um, and uh, uh, I think of uh, Peter on the mountain of transfiguration. I, th I think that story is often uh, misinterpreted. Uh, I think uh, when it says that Peter didn't know what he was saying when he said, let's build tents and stay here, uh, I, I don't think the point is that Peter was confused, as he often was. I think the point was Peter had bad theology. That Peter thought he could have the glory and continue the glory without the suffering. And uh, I think we've had a glorious time, and it's time to go. Um, I, I don't usually quote movies, but did any of you ever see Ferris Bueller's Day Off? <laughs> and if you watch the credits at the end, at the end of the credits, no one stays to watch the credits to the end, but at the end of the credits, Ferris Bueller reappears and says, why are you here? <laughs> go! Go! And that's what I'm supposed to talk about today. Why are you here? Go! And so our text is the Great Commission, um, Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. This is God's own word. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, I've, I've heard many sermons on uh, the Great Commission. You've probably heard many sermons on the Great Commission. I hope you're not thinking to yourself secretly, I'd rather have heard something else today. Um, but I'm always struck, and I don't know that I've ever heard anybody really preach on it, that they worshipped him, but some doubted. Here are the 11 who've been with him all these years. They've been purified. Judas is gone. And some, not just one, not just two, maybe just two. That would be some out of 11, I guess. But I keep thinking back to that question, how do you counsel someone struggling with unbelief? Maybe that's a verse to turn to and say, look, a couple, at least a couple of the disciples themselves standing in the presence of the risen Lord, probably on the, mount, the mountain where he'd preached the Sermon on the Mount to them, doubted. So we all need encouragement. We all need direction. We all need help. Why are you still here? Why don't you go? Go, therefore, Jesus said. 
and I want to think with you about that, and then it'll be time to go. Um, Jesus said, go make disciples. And uh, we've spent some time in this conference talking about the difficult circumstances, the increasingly difficult circumstances, it seems, in which we find ourselves as American Christians. So the question, how do you make disciples, is perhaps more pressing, more crucial than ever. How do we make disciples? And I have, you'll be amazed to hear, three points that emerge from what Jesus says here. He says, go, make disciples, go as the church. I think sometimes we miss that in, or at least don't emphasize this enough in this uh, uh, great commission that Jesus gives us. I think we have often in the past very much stressed the responsibility of individual Christians to be witnesses for Christ. And that's true, and that's important, that's vital. I don't want anything I say to seem to undermine that. But I think Jesus here is primarily thinking more communally. He sends disciples to make disciples. And when he sends disciples out, he usually sends them more than one at a time. He wants disciples to go make disciples. In Luke, in Luke, we read about sheep making sheep. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel as sheep. Uh, Jesus is sending not angels, but fallible human disciples to make more disciples, and we go as the church. At the center of Jesus' thinking, we've heard more than once quite correctly, this conference is the church. Uh, the church as a is at the center of what Jesus is doing. He's building a church. He's building a people. Uh, He's building his new Israel. Uh, He's building that new humanity that will be his forever in glory. And he's sending us out together to call people into a new community. Uh, That's crucial for us to bear in mind. Uh, We are never called as Christians, well, never, Uh, we are hardly ever, most of us never called as Christians to be Christians alone. If you are utterly alone as a Christian, read Psalm 88. Um, There are times when Christians feel entirely alone, but God wants us to feel and experience and be part of a community of faith. And we're to go together. We're to go as disciples, as those linked together in a common faith to pursue a common goal of building the church of Jesus Christ around the world, discipling the nations. It's a a, a community confronting a community to build a bigger community. And so this is crucial that we see that, that we're called to be serving Christ's great commission as the church. And so it's important for all of us as we're about to leave this wonderful conference to ask ourselves, what is our relationship with our church? If you don't have a church, you need to find one. That's the calling of Christ. And don't be a floater. I'm well past that age where you begin to have floaters in your eyes, little black spots that float by. There are Christians who relate to the church that way. they are little spots that float by. And uh, there are Christians who are constantly saying, oh, this church isn't quite good enough. I'm going to move on to the next, and then the next, and then the next, and then the next. We are not called to be floaters. We are called to be constituent parts, active participants in the building of a church. Not primarily a physical building, but a spiritual building, a a family, a community that cares for one another. 
People can't care for you if you float in and out. They won't know you. You can't care for others if you float in and out. You won't know them. And so this is a wonderful time to take a bit of personal inventory and ask, am I as connected with my church as I ought to be? Um, the fun thing in these conferences is to talk about what's wrong with all those other people. <laughs> so since I can leave soon, I can be more annoying <laughs> and ask us what's wrong with us. Are we really connected to a church? Are we part of a church? Do we have a sense that we're part of a community? Do we have a sense that if we left this community, they would be sorry to see us go? They would feel impoverished. Uh, this is why um, the Reformed have always said discipline is part of the true church. Uh, elders should have watch over your souls. If you're an elder, you ought to be watching over the souls of your people. You ought to know who's there and who's not there. You know, the Dutch Reformed do all things perfectly. <laughs> and they had an institution that was called Heisbezoek, house visiting. The elders would come to every family at least once a year. In Geneva, it was four times a year. So the Dutch are a little, you know, slacking off. <laughs> but think of that. Coming to your house once a year to ask, how goes it spiritually? Are you, are you growing in grace? Are you connected to the church? Um, can we hear what you think about how things are going in the church? Uh, no, we're not here to hear endless complaints about the minister. Uh, we're here to see how we can all grow closer together, how we can all grow closer to Christ. And I really believe, as we live increasingly in a world in America, where families are falling apart, where neighborhoods have fallen apart, uh, where we don't know people anymore, where all sorts of people are, are isolated. The church as community of love and faith and discipline is going to shine ever more brightly in this world to people who are lonely. Some years ago, we had friends whose grandson, little boy, was killed in an automobile accident. And the highway patrolman came to visit them uh, a day later, and he said to them, you must be Christians. And they said, yes, why? And he said, because there are so many people coming to visit you. He said, you can't imagine the homes I visit where tragedy has hit and they're alone. No one is there. No one is coming. And what a light to the world that the church is the place of love and care and compassion. And so ask yourself, am I doing what I ought to be doing to be part of Christ's church? Because the commission is to go as the church, and then to go according to the commission. We're not to go just with our own bright ideas. I hate to be the bearer of bad news. I really, you know, I'm easygoing, Bob. I'm optimistic. Uh, everything is good. I'm the bearer of bad news. You're not that bright. You're not that clever. <laughs> you need to go with the commission that Christ has given us. Can you still be surprised by the Great Commission? Do you know it so well that there's nothing in it that surprises you? Isn't it surprising that when Jesus says, go make disciples, he sums up disciple-making in two very brief points. If somebody said, what would it take to make a disciple of Jesus Christ? How long would you go on for? How many points would you have? Jesus only has two. And one of them is about baptism. Now, that's surprising. I think for a lot of us, if we were asked, how do you make disciples of Jesus Christ? 
we might eventually get to baptism, but we probably wouldn't start with it the way Jesus does. You know, it's very important to let the Bible surprise you sometimes. And when the Bible surprises you, shocks you, now we're too pious to say this, but or annoys you, that's the time to pause and meditate and reflect and ask, what am I missing here that it surprises me? I think it, Jesus is giving us a summary of what it takes uh, to make disciples, partly to say it's not that hard. It is hard, but it's not that hard. Two, two things to make disciples. Bring them in and build them up. How about that? Bring them in and build them up. That's what Jesus did for us, didn't he? He brought us in and he built us up. How is baptism being used here to describe the bringing them in? Well, I think it encourages us to reflect on the fact that we shouldn't think of baptism narrowly. I don't think Jesus is just um, referring to the moment of water. Now, that's clearly in his mind. It's the sort of culmination of the bringing them in. But I think he's encouraging us to think sort of all that we were taught about baptism, and particularly maybe to go back in our minds to John the Baptist. In some versions, John the Presbyterian. (laughs) All right, all right, all right. What do we read about John? We don't read about John that he just came with water, right? He didn't come with a a fire hose sprinkling everybody he could get with water, and that was all he did. No, we're told he came preaching good news. He came preaching good news. And what was the good news? The kingdom of God is at hand. The king is coming. So, Baptism, in the broad sense of what John was doing, was first of all preaching, preaching good news about Jesus and salvation in Him, preaching the call to repentance. You need a new life. You need to be a new person. You need a new identity. You need to change. That's what John came preaching. And he said, pretending won't do. Going through the motions won't do. Just having the water won't do. You have to hear the good news, believe the good news, repent, and bring forth a fruit of repentance. So, bringing them in isn't having them sign a decision card. Bringing them in is a big deal. It involves a lot a lot of telling, a lot of helping, a lot of instructing, and then bringing them to the new identity that the waters of baptism represent. And so, this bringing them in is really crucial. And the waters of baptism and the preaching that surrounds baptism It's a new covenant. It's a new covenant. And all of those of you uh, who, as who hasn't, have spent time meditating on the 16th century Dutch Reformed baptismal liturgy, (laughs) haven't you taken Dathanus into your heart? Okay, you've never heard of Dathanus, have you? Shame on you. Shame, shame, shame. The 16th century Dutch Reformed baptismal liturgy is a marvel, and and it has these arresting phrases, and and one of them is, all covenants have two parts. That's an important thing to remember about covenants. They have two parts. And the first part of a covenant, 
the new covenant that John has preached that Jesus will inaugurate fully, this new covenant, first of all, has promises. And baptism speaks of the promises of God. And bringing people in to be disciples requires a knowledge and an embracing of the promises of God. And this form takes note of the fact that Jesus has baptized them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And if you stop and think about that for a minute, in terms of promises, you can begin to see the Father has promises and the Son has promises and the Spirit has promises to us. When the gospel is coming to us and calling us to come in, and share in the new identity and the new covenant that Christ is establishing. What are the promises of the Father? That he'll adopt us as children and heirs. Is that good or what? That we'll be adopted as children and heirs. That's the new family. That's the reunion people look forward to. Um, Children and heirs. And what does the Son promise us? He promises that He'll wash us in His blood from all our sins and incorporate us into the fellowship of His death and resurrection so that we, freed from all our sins, are accounted righteous before God. What a promise. What a promise is held out to us in baptism. And the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit promise us? That He will dwell in us and sanctify us till we shall finally be presented without spot amongst the assembly of the elect in life eternal. Adopted, washed, sanctified, glorified. What a promise! Now, I want to be clear, this is not what baptism does, this is what baptism means. Some Christians have gotten confused and think the water of baptism does something apart from the Word and the Spirit. No, baptism means something, baptism promises something. Baptism declares as a visible word the promises of God to those who need a new identity, who need to be adopted and washed and sanctified. And that's how we bring them in, hold out those promises. But in all covenants, there are two parts. And therefore, am I by baptism obligated unto new obedience, a new life, a new lifestyle, so that I have to be committed to what baptism promises me. And that means faith, and it means repentance, and it means a new life. And that's what it means to bring them in. Are you excited about that? Isn't that a wonderful thing? that we are a new people and that newness is marked in baptism. And the great thing is that that newness is ours when we embrace it by faith and follow Christ in new life. And, And we ought to pause and think more often of ourselves as a baptized people. The problem is too much when we talk about baptism, if we talk about it at all, we only talk about who ought to be baptized. And I've said before, there are some people right about that and some people wrong. (laughs) But more important really than who ought to be baptized is the question, What does God say to me as a baptized person, not only at the moment of baptism, but through my whole life, whether I can remember my baptism or not? The reality of my baptism says constantly to me, God has made promises to you. Do you believe them? 
Do you follow them? Has God brought you in? If you're brought in, you live out your life in thankfulness for the promises he has made and that he is fulfilling in you. That's what it means to make disciples according to the Great Commission. That's why Jesus surprises us with baptism and reminds us we shouldn't be surprised because it has been revealed to us in the Scriptures as so full, so meaningful, so important. And baptism, of course, points us back to the church. Because what is the essential, one, well, the essential, one of the essential characters of baptism is that we are baptized. We don't baptize ourselves. Now, there have been, because every crazy idea has some representative in the history of the church. <laughs> there are a tiny number of people who believed in what they called say baptism. Say from Latin meaning yourself, that you could baptize yourself. Those people are crazy. <laughs> That's a technical theological argument against them. They're crazy. <laughs> but we all know that we don't baptize ourselves, do we? Whether we see a baby presented for baptism and see the helplessness of the baby, or whether we watch a believer's baptism and see the helplessness of the person being baptized. I was with a group of Baptist ministers once. <laughs> and they were telling adult baptism stories. I had no clue as a pedo-baptist, how many things could go wrong? <laughs> you know, for us, by and large, the only thing that could go wrong is you take the lid off the font, look in, and there's no water. <laughs> My favorite story that I heard that night was the man who baptized a woman with really long hair, and when he leaned her back, he stepped on the hair, <laughs> and he couldn't get her up. Now, if that's not an argument for pedo-baptism, I don't know what is. <laughs> but baptism is always at least a two-person operation. It's, a, it's the church at work. It's, it's communal. It's part of the community. And that's part of the blessing. It's, it's such a blessing not only to be baptized, but to watch others be baptized and to be renewed every time in the meaning of our baptism. When Luther was asked, how do you know you're a Christian? He said, I've been baptized. Now, he didn't mean by that that the water did anything magical. He meant by that, I've had promises of God that touched me, and I cling to those promises even more than any subjective experience, because there the promise of God is unchanging and secure for me. And I think we ought to be able to say that more often. It's not the only thing we want to say, but we want to be able to say, my baptism tells me I belong to God. So bring them in. Bring them into the church. And then build them up. If we bring them in, what do we do with them? We build them up. We build us up. How? By the teaching of the church to observe all things that Christ has commanded us. Now, we had a question at the question and answer period. Is, is election a primary doctrine? And I showed, I thought, admirable restraint. Um, not saying anything. Um, and it's not that it isn't legitimate to talk about primary, secondary, tertiary doctrines. There, there is some value to that. There's some usefulness to that. But let's listen to what our Lord says, namely that the church is not to be picking and choosing 
what things he taught us that we want to talk about. We have Gospels, four of them, and we have a Bible, and everything in there is what our God has taught us, and everything in there we're to be believing and following and teaching. Now, as a professor of mine at seminary said, the Bible's a big book. It's amazing what you have to pay tuition for. <laughs> the Bible's a big book. We can't keep most of us, the whole Bible and everything in it, in our minds at the same time. But our commitment, our, our desire, our, our purpose should be to learn more and more about what Jesus has taught us so that we can live more and more according to his holy will. That's what we're called to. That's what making disciples is. And that's why it is so important that we be a people ever desiring to know more of what Christ would have us know and be. You know, the New Testament itself talks about the the dangers of being satisfied as what we might call milk Christians. Uh, Christians who have had a taste of the Word of God and are contented to be bottle-fed for the rest of their lives. Baby bottle-fed. And therefore remain immature. Um, Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 3. The letter to the Hebrews talks about it, Hebrews 5, 11 through 14. And it's a, a matter of distress for the apostles that some Christians are content to remain immature, untaught, and unable to teach. If you haven't matured in the faith, if you haven't grown in the faith, if you haven't grown in the Word of God, how will you be a disciple maker? How will you fulfill the Great Commission? Because you're still being fed, fed with a baby bottle. And the apostles say to all of us, grow up. It's time to grow up. It's past time to grow up. And we want to long for the pure teaching of the Word. Remember Jesus in John 8 said to us, talking about being a disciple, if you abide in my word, you are my disciple. You know, this isn't something we just make up, the importance of the word. This is the testimony of the Savior. This is the declaration of the king whose kingdom is coming that we are to abide in His Word, we're to remain in His Word, we're to grow in His Word. And it's that Word that is constantly refining us and shaping us and directing us. And I think in the kind of world in which we live, a great responsibility is ours if we're not ministers and pastors is to be encouraging ministers and pastors to preach the Word, to preach the whole Word. Ministers in our culture are under tremendous pressure, the pressure to accommodate, because accommodation brings in more people. I had a pastor friend who said, it's very discouraging to listen what a lot of ministers talk about when they get together. They talk about buildings, bodies, and budgets. What new buildings have you built to show that your church is flourishing? How many bodies attend there to show that you've been a success? What is your budget like to show that you're better than the minister down the block? But ministers are sometimes pushed into that ungodliness because of the expectation of the people. They want new buildings. They want more bodies. They want to see a big budget. You need to go home to your minister and say, I want to hear the word from you. 
I want the fullness of the word. I so love the word, I want you to preach it to me morning and evening on Sunday. One of the tragedies of our time is so many churches have abandoned the evening service, and therefore people are getting, at best, half as much word as they used to get. So it's so important that the church encourage the ministers to be faithful in the work that they're called to do. Uh, because ministers, you've probably not noticed this, but ministers are only human. And uh, they get discouraged. They get distracted. They get worn down. You know, my time is fairly, I think it's close enough to the end that I dare say this. Because I can get out of here fast. <laughs> Where's David Terrio to provide bodyguards? <laughs> if in this past year you've asked your minister to preach on politics, you should go home and apologize to him. Yeah. Your minister is not a politician although maybe a little bit to survive in the ministry. <laughs> Your minister is not given by God any particular insight uh, into whether we'd rather have Derek Thomas in the podium of the house or Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> uh, I have a friend who came to our church and she said, um, she's a lifelong devout Christian, she said, I'm a Democrat. And it's very difficult for me to worship in my church because there's so much politics. And I love coming to your church because you don't talk about politics from the pulpit. I said, I'm really glad to hear that because probably my church has more Republicans than your church. <laughs> but we're not in church to be Republicans or Democrats. We should, as Christian citizens, talk about the implications of our faith for politics and for political decisions but that's not the work of the pulpit. The minister has no special competence in that area. But the minister ought to have competence in the making of disciples, bringing them in and building them up. That's what the Word teaches him and through him should teach us. That's what we need to be pursuing. That's what we need to be encouraging. And again, I think we'll shine brightly as a light in a dark place when we stick to the Word in the church. So, go as the church to fulfill the Great Commission. Go according to the Great Commission to fulfill that commission. And then go with confidence. Go with confidence. Uh, Jesus begins and ends the Great Commission with words to build up our confidence as we go. Um, I believe we're living in an age that will make 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 12 an especially attractive passage for us about the weakness of the church. In many ways, we're going to see the weakness of the church culturally. Uh, we may see persecution of the church. Um, but weakness and suffering do not necessarily translate to a loss of confidence. Jesus was weak, and Jesus suffered, but he never failed in confidence in what God was doing. And so Jesus speaks to us and calls us to a confidence as we go. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Imagine yourself standing on a hillside on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. And there are only 12 of you there. Jesus is one. And you're standing with 11 other disciples 
who along with you all fled away when Jesus was arrested. And now we see the resurrected Lord, but some of us are doubting. And then he makes this declaration. All authority has been given to me. Jesus says the most amazing things. John 16, 33. I have conquered the world. Now, I think the translators tone that down a little unnecessarily and say, I have overcome the world. Mm -mm. I have conquered the world. I have conquered the world by my willingness to embrace weakness and suffering on the cross. And now, in resurrection glory, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Do we believe that? Do we need to fret about what authority functions in Washington? As citizens, we need to think about that. As Christians, we don't have to give it a moment's thought. Christ is not building his church out of Washington. He's building the church out of the church. And, and I hear echoes of Psalm 2 here. I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Here's the moment Jesus is commissioning us to go gather the nations that God has given to him as his inheritance to himself. What a moment. What a moment. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. That's what Jesus is saying here. All authority is given to me. I think he's also saying, you know what, as you go out and do your work, even if you're fearful, even if you're frightened, uh, even if you don't speak when you should speak, I'm going to build my church, and not one will be lost. What an encouragement that is for us. It's not our cleverness that will build the church. It's not even our faithfulness that will build the church. As important as faithfulness is, it's Christ who will build his church. And, and what an encouragement to know, as he promised in John 6, 39. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me. What authority, what a sovereign, what a king, what a glory that our Christ has and under which we can operate. And then he closes with this wonderful promise. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There are three alls in this uh, great commission. All authority, all nations, all that I have commanded. And then it's a little harder to translate the, the fourth all effectively into English. I think the best way would maybe be, and lo, I am with you all days. To the end of the age. You know, always is kind of abstract or general. It's not general in the Greek. It's every day I am with you. What an encouragement. Jesus is with us every day of the life we live, serving him, making disciples, bringing them in, and building them up. What an encouragement. And here I hear an echo of Psalm 23. See, you need to know your Psalter to hear the echoes all through the New Testament. Psalm 23, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You are with me. David knew the Lord was with him. David, in the worst struggles of life, knew the Lord was with him. And Jesus reminds us all, I'll be with you. You don't go to work for me by yourself. You don't go on your own. You don't go without me. 
I will be with you. I will be with you. Every day. As you do my work. So what's left to say? Go. Go. Why are you still here? <laughs> All right, you can stay for a little longer with the music. <laughs> but then go. Go as the church. Go according to the Great Commission. Go with confidence that God will use you to accomplish his purpose. And whether we see great things happening or see relatively little happening, Jesus says, I'm with you. I'm accomplishing my purpose. Don't worry. Don't fret. Not one will be lost. And I, when I return in glory, all the elect will have been gathered. And then forever we'll be with the Lord. Comfort one another with those words. And let us rejoice together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a Savior who has all authority, who is already King of kings and Lord of lords, who is accomplishing his purpose and will never at any point be thwarted, but will build his church and establish a new humanity in his blood and in his name. Uh, fill us with confidence in serving him. Encourage us in the truth of his word. Build up our churches that they might truly be lights shining in a dark place and help us to look beyond this world to the life of the world that you have promised, an inheritance undefiled, imperishable, that fades not away. Fill us with that great hope, we pray, a hope that can only be fulfilled by our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.